Hey everybody, this is Chris, and I am very excited to have with me today J.D. Iker. He's a singer-songwriter. You can check him out at jdiker.com. He also has links on Spotify, Apple iTunes, and YouTube. You can check out f28live.com, and you'll click on the podcast link. There'll be a complete blog on this uh, interview all by itself. So you'll see links to his music, his website, YouTube videos, place to purchase albums as well. So make sure you check out f28live.com after the interview and you can find all the links to him. JD, thank you so much for being here. How you doing? Great. Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited about this. This has taken us uh, over a year, I think, <laughs> to <laughs> yeah, finally that's get this right. interview and said. Um, that's all right. We're here. <laughs> how are you holding up with everything going on with COVID right now? Uh, you know, these days, holding up holding up all right, thankfully. Um, you know, kind of, as, as I'm sure with everybody, kind of took a little bit of reframing and, and getting used to to the uh, the new situation, but um, thankfully, you know, I've been able to stay healthy. My family's healthy, and, and we're we're, uh, we're floating through. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's thanks been, for asking. It's been crazy with, especially for me and F two eight live covering the, mm-hmm. the shows and everything. The whole season, I mean, was pretty much canceled. Yeah, man. Everything. Every venue. Did you have but, shows upcoming this year that you had to put on hold until next year? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, right kind of. Lead, well, we, I mean, right when everything shut down, we, we had a couple gigs that week that got canceled, and then um, we had a, a European tour that that got wiped, and um, oh, uh, so we had a rec- record release tour, and, and not so much a formal tour, but just dates kind of um, in support of that. So it's been a bummer. I think we lost uh, somewhere to the tune of like forty five to fifty five shows, um, maybe a few more at this point. But um, oh my yeah, so gosh. it's 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 been a it's been a bummer for sure. But you know we've kind of uh, you know we've, we've, I'm hustling and I'm I'm able to play some you know very small, socially distanced outdoor things and and um, uh, it's, you know I've, I've kind of pivoted. I started doing a Patreon page and, and a lot of live streaming and just kind of keeping did, things afloat. I did see that. It's anybody listening. We will link to that as well on the blog, so you can check oh, cool. that out also on there. Um, Thanks, what shows did you have planned to do overseas that you were going to do this year? Yeah, well, we, I was going to do a um, kind of. Uh, I've been I've been doing the circuit in um, Germany, Austria, and. Um, and this would have been our, th- our third time over there, so I was going to go with my uh, drummer Dylan. He he plays a like a little broken down super drum nice kit. guy, super nice guy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. A couple actually, times, a nice guy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you guys, uh, you you guys. Actually, we met at a, a duo show with with Dylan and, and me, and and that's when you and I first met. I think Chris. So yeah, it was actually yeah. Sister Hazel, right and, in the Carolinas. Yeah, yeah, and it was at the Lincoln Theater. And yeah. a funny kind of story behind that is I normally, when, when I get the, the go ahead to cover a band, I normally don't go to the opening uh-huh. shows. I'll normally go okay. to the, to the act itself. Uh-huh. And I went to that show and it was packed. I mean, if I mm-hmm. remember correctly, it was sold out. That I whole think time. it may have been. Yeah. And I remember walking backstage and I had not met you, had no idea who you were. And I walked right backstage, and I was like, hey, my name's Chris. I'm taking some pictures. Are you okay with me going on stage? You were like, whatever, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You never yeah. hear artists say that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, nope, we don't yeah. want you on stage. But, yeah, you you gave That's me funny. full full use. So I, I appreciated Man. that because I was like, oh, I get some pictures that I wanted to take. Yay. Dude, you got some great photos. I mean, that, that that's the thing is, like, if, you, if you're okay with being a little more open to – yeah, I mean, you just seem like, I don't know what it was, but you just kind of seem like you knew what you were doing. So I, I wasn't too worried, but, uh, I, I hope so. but yeah, I mean, but you, yeah, de- you definitely did. You definitely did. And you know, you got, you got some really cool shots. There's a uh, one, one photo of, of me and Dylan, um, with the, you know, from, from our backs, you can see the, or it's yes. of our backs. You can see the crowd and that yes. shot is awesome. I think, in fact, I think I use that in promotion of a European tour just to kind of tie it together. But I think we used that shot as, um, you know, a couple of years ago as we were well, uh, that promoting was really, the dates. That was really the first time because I had never heard of you before that. So this was mm-hmm. kind of my introduction to you. And I gotcha. remember I walked around at the front part of the stage before you came on and mm-hmm. I was talking to the, the manager of the Lincoln theater and we're just kind of shooting the shit talking and yeah. you came out on stage and you started to perform and for me, it was one of those moments. This is going to sound cheesy, but I'm being honest with you. It was yeah. really one of those stop motion kind of moments because I was like, holy shit, this guy's good. Oh, like, man. He really sounds good. Thanks. And it was just you and your guitar and Dylan. That was it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't yeah. like a huge band. You weren't like with these huge light shows. You were actually just focusing on the music itself. And you could see the fans yeah. and everybody there were just completely in tune to it. 
Oh, man. Planning. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate you saying that, man. That was a, that was a fun show. I'm glad it I'm glad it came across. Uh, yeah. Once both, I once know, I heard my head that. and off stage. <laughs> Yeah. Once I heard that show, I was like, okay, this, I got to talk to this guy. And that was one of the times too, that I never really ever go up to an artist after the set. Mm -hmm. Cause I don't want to be that yeah. creepy guy, but <laughs> I was after it. I was like, I got to talk to him. I just gotta, I gotta get a picture with him. You know, I gotta yeah. be able to talk with him. Um, do you remember the song that you played when you opened up for that show? Uh, man, I think it was a short set. So we, we, we probably played maybe five, to probably five or six songs would be my guess. I think we usually would with Hazel, we were doing like maybe 25, 30 minute opening slots. It might've been a 40 minute, but I doubt it. So we probably played like, Oh man, I don't know. I think, I think I remember playing uh free fall and as a cover. And I, the only reason I, I, re oh, yes. I remember that is I think, I think that was the thing that I don't even, I don't, we haven't played that in maybe since then, to be honest, but uh, I just remember it get like, you know, for, for as big of a crowd as it was, I remember that everyone kind of like tuned in, tightly for that song uh yes, it was you know it's, it's a cover that. so it's, it was a safe that. bet but and, but and um, the, yeah the, we I played a mix of stuff <laughs> the funny thing that made me laugh too is this just showed me kind of your personality and the way that you are you had <laughs> this sign so for listeners i might be uh, listening oh, yeah. to this it's it's hard to kind of describe but he went on stage <laughs> and i saw this just it was almost like a, a huge white board and I couldn't see what was on the whiteboard. Yeah. And all of a sudden, towards, I think, the middle of your set, you start talking mm -hmm. about people being able to find your music, and you put up this huge whiteboard. And it, <laughs> did it have a text number on it or a phone number Yeah, on that it? sounds like me. Yeah. I, you know, that, that company, I mean, we kind of we lost, like, a ton of emails toward the end of using that service, so I, I stopped doing it. But, yeah, oh, for wow. years I had I had a big uh, – yeah, it was, a, it was like you could text your email address to that phone number, and then you got, like, a song right back, and then I could like you were on, on the mailing list basically. Um, and yeah, so that, that's, a, I'm sure I had some spiel and was, was pretty, hopefully I was self deprecating about the whole thing. Cause it, what a, what a weird thing to bring up in the middle of the show. I just, it was just one of those moments. I remember I went back to one of my friends after the show was done and I was like, all right, this guy's got a sense of humor because he just put up a huge <laughs> board with a number for people to reach out to. I mean, it was a good idea yeah. to be honest. That's one of the ideas. Yeah. That's actually pretty good. Yeah, um, uh, to, uh, to start with it. Now you were originally from Youngstown, Ohio, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, born and raised and still there now. You're still there now. Mm -hmm. So is that yeah. where you do a lot of your recording for when you're going into the studio? Do you use a studio around that area? Yeah, uh, yeah. most of what, the more recent stuff, uh, we've, we've kind of done the like the Nashville and L.A. Um, runs where you go down and cut a record that way. But yeah, um, in the past couple of years, I either record at my home, um, literally at the desk I'm sitting at right now um, talking to you, or um, down, right down the street, there's a new studio that popped up a couple of years ago called Court Street. And it's actually the, the namesake of the, um, the newest record. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and it's just a, it's a great room. Real, uh, Mike Estock is the engineer there and his ears are just, he, he really has, you know, golden ears. He just knows what he's doing. So, um, so yeah, so I've, everything, you know, lately has been, um, in Youngstown area, which is cool. Have you done, what records did you do? Did you do in Tennessee? You said, did you do records in Tennessee as well? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the, uh, we, we did, let's see, we cut, um, a record called into place uh, when I, I kind of prior to being just JD Iker had a band with me as well. Um, and we still have some of those guys in the project too, but, um, yeah, we cut a record called into place in, in Nashville and we cut a record called the compass EP, um, which was like partially here in my house and then partially in, uh, in LA with uh, I Bill think Luffler, that's, I think that's there. one of the ones I heard. I think it was the compass. EP. Okay. Is one of the ones yeah, I actually, heard. you guys. I think you guys covered that when we when we put it out, I which think was really so. kind. Yes, I think we you did. have been so nice to me, man. I, I really do appreciate every, everything. You're always super super cool about you know kind of making sure people know that, about the new stuff and it means a lot. Well, it's one of those things that too that when you see singer songwriters that are as passionate about what they do, but not mm -hmm. only passionate but are good at what they do. <laughs> you know, because Thanks. to me, your sound. This might be a little off on how I kind of describe how your sound is, but it's a mixture of a little bit of David Gray to me, like early mm -hmm. 2000 White Ladder album. And yeah. then also, um, oh, I just forgot his name. Um, but there was another artist, another singer songwriter. But mm -hmm. I had those two kind of mixed together because you have this very yeah. uh, it's it's like a melodic, but very kind of rough 
singer songwriter sound. Mm-hmm. That that sounds weird to say. I know that's not. Oh, exactly I do that. Weird. I like that. I like that. Um, I think the vocal tones and everything like that's a very calm, relaxed kind of vocal tone to it, and that's uh-huh. one of the things that drew me in. I was like, oh, this guy's just you know, this music has got some meaning to it, and it's very chill and relaxed. But you Thanks, also man. have songs that have a more pop beat to it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I've kind of gone through a couple uh, identity crisis crises, <laughs> I guess. So you know, well, you <laughs> had one song. It came out in YouTube last year, I think it was. And it was uh-huh. like a poppy song by a pool. Oh yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's called "Ain't My Scene." Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> like that crazy song. video. What? what yeah, came, actually, I do want to ask you about that. What came up with that yeah. idea for that song? Uh, as far as the video? Yeah. Oh, just the song itself, like the oh, writing the song. process yeah, well, of the song. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny. I, I think about bands that I like, and like. Um, when they change their sounds or when they evolve, you know, there's a part of you that's like, no, stay, keep doing what you're already doing because it's good. You know, mm-hmm. like you, you want to kind of, but then, but then now that I'm, I've, I've been you know, like an act for a while, I realize like it is impossible to not want to like explore new ideas, you know, like sonically and everything. And so I just kind of was like, you know, I'm just going to be, I, I, I was kind of in the same circuit of like, if you put me in a studio by myself to produce something, I was going to, it was going to have a piano and an acoustic guitar and probably like a, an electric guitar, but you wouldn't notice the electric guitar and then drums and bass, you know, like that's like what I would do yeah. with every song. And so I was like, I need to not, I just need to get out of that headspace. So um, I, this great producer, his name's Bill Leffler um, in LA. He, he had become a friend of mine through another project or two that we had worked on. And so, um, so I was like, man, I, I just, I don't want to, I, I just want to be uncomfortable. I, I want like, let's have arguments about what I'm going to sound like, you know, <laughs> for a change. And so we, he, he just kind of pushed me a little bit more like in that, like kind of alt pop indie pop thing. And, uh, and I, I kind of allowed it to, to happen. And, but the song itself is, is about that as well. So it's called Ain't My Scene. It's just about like pushing yourself into uncomfortable situations, kind of knowing you're going to be uncomfortable, but you know, that's how yeah, we, you don't, you don't, you don't get anywhere new if you're not, if yeah. you don't go somewhere new, you know what I mean? So exactly. I think, I think it was just kind of about that. So that song was kind of like the, the opener for that, um, that record because it, it kind of just touched on that idea. How did you like that transition going from what you normally are used to doing and, and kind of taking a yeah. dive into that new style? Man, I, I, I really loved it. I mean, I, it was fun to, um, just to, yeah, to kind of have a, a fresh perspective on things. And, um, I think, I think we kind of, we kind of caught, a portion of the of our of our falling off guard a little bit maybe off balance with, with that decision um and so so uh you know, this the newest record we put out was kind of a, a return to form like way back to the, the initial sound where you know it's just a band in a, in a room playing live um so we kind of now we kind of have these two uh this is like dichotomy of, of sounds but um it, it was great to do it I, I don't know that i'll ever go as pop as that again maybe but um yeah um, but I, I, you know, I don't really regret it. I think it was, it was kind of something that needed to happen for me. And I kind of needed to know that was, that ain't my scene is like as pop as I think I could comfortably go. You know? So I mean, it's a it good to find tune. that limit. It's catchy. Oh, so, I mean, it's one of the thanks. songs I remember when I first heard it and I was like, Oh, this is different. This is different yeah. from what he's, he's normally putting out, but it yeah. was catchy and I liked it. And I know thanks, when man. I looked at YouTube, it looks like a lot of other people liked it as well. So thanks. I think you got a pop hit on your hands with that one right there. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, my bank account doesn't agree, but I, 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 I'd like to think it's all right. <laughs> um, one of the things I do want to talk about that's actually very, very cool. We briefly talked about this when I actually um, met you at the Sister Hazel show that mm-hmm. you got to work with Nicholas Sparks, the incredibly famous author. Mm-hmm. And yeah. now you wrote a song two by two for his book, two by two. Mm-hmm. How did that process come to be? And, and what is it? writing a song for a book is that something that goes on a soundtrack to the book or how does that work yeah yeah it's a you know probably the only the only hurdle uh in that whole project was frankly explaining it because it is kind of a weird thing um but uh it, it essentially what he wanted to do he it was his it was his 20th book and he wanted to do like something kind of special for it and and for folks he's got a really loyal readership um he you know he just writes these kind of like epic love stories and so uh he wanted to, to have a song inspired by the novel and then um, give that song out as a, like a free download to, to all his, his readers. And so, oh, um, okay. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, so basically, uh, you know, he, I guess he was reviewing um, bands and, and, you know, different singers and whatnot. And uh, I was very lucky uh, man named Jason Sprague at, at um, 
Warner's distribution um, arm called ADA, Alternative Distribution Association. He he had been a uh, supporter, kind of a champion, and just a, he's just a nice guy. And he basically like put my music in the mix. And so they heard a song of mine from way back when, and uh, and decided maybe yeah you know, let's get let's give this guy a shot. And so um, it kind of it just kind of became this this process where you know we got on the phone with him and we talked about. Um, he hadn't finished the book yet, but he kind of knew where how, where I was going to land in the ending and everything. So we talked through the book and the story, and I'm like jotting down you know notes like a wild man um, on a notebook and just trying to get like all the themes that he wants in in the in the song and and the, you know relate to the book. And then he kind of just cut me loose and he said, "All right, you know, I hope hopefully there's something in this." And the one cool thing about that process was it, it, he he made it clear that he didn't like want me to. I, I think about this moment because it was like it was critical because at the time I'm this like angsty y- younger dude and I, you know I'm like I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna just sell out and write any yeah. song you know but like that's what's going through my head I'm like this better be okay you know I don't know you know in hindsight I'm like dude write the song you know but <laughs> but uh, but at the time I was like you know I gotta be careful about this and and but one of the last things he said on the phone that uh, that first call was that he's like listen just make sure you write a song that like you would want to play don't just write a song for a book. He's like, I, it would be awesome if this were like a song that you just kept playing at shows and you felt good about. And he's like, so, I, you know, I, I'm not asking you to, to bend your sound or anything. He's so like, make he it didn't fit. really have too much input. He kind of gave you free reign to be able to oh, sprinkled yeah. in some ideas. So that, and that's rare. If you yeah. did that, that's rare for somebody that especially that has that popularity. Right. Yeah. And I mean, we, he heard the first version and he did have some ideas. He was like, you know, I'd, I'd love to tighten down. Um, and I kind of, in hindsight, I get it. Like he just, he really wanted me to nail the meaning of, of two by two as it related to, to the book and everything. So, um, so I kind of came in with maybe a broader, um, idea and then he kind of like just helped me t- hone in a couple ideas. Um, you know, he just kind of threw, threw stuff back. So I did a revision and then he was like, yeah, this is it. Um, uh, but, but never did he like tell me a, how to write a lyric or like, it has to have this, you know what I mean? Like, which wow. I thought, I just thought that was cool. And kind of a, you could tell, I could tell that he, he himself, you know, in his own, um, in his own art is an artist because he under, he was kind of sensitive to that right out of, before anybody said anything, you know, which is kind of cool. So he I respected did, he him did for state, a lot for that. He did state in an interview. I watched an interview with you guys. Um, I mm-hmm. think it was on his channel. Maybe I think it was, and okay. he did talk about that. He was like saying to you basically that you're two different artists with two different platforms that you mm-hmm. guys use on. And he was talking about that. He doesn't understand how, you know, certain rhythms are made and things like that. And he kind of looked at you and he was like, so I'll just leave that all to you. <laughs> like, I'll just let you, <laughs> yeah, right. you do all that. Right. Right. Did, yeah. did no, you he go was, on he a was tour for that? that gracious in that way. Did you go on a yes. tour for that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, so what, the way it ended up working was we, we I finished the song and then, um, the, the, we, we put out like this, uh, I think a teaser of the song ahead of the book release. And then, um, there was like a, a media, kind of like press tour day. And then we went on a, a relatively short book tour. It was, um, you know, kind of just like stops across the country and, and I would play, um, the song or maybe a couple songs at the signing events and stuff. So sometimes it was, uh, I, I like joking about it cause it's kind of funny. Like there were some days where, um, we were, there was like a seated theater audience of like, you know, maybe a thousand or 1500 people. Oh, wow. And, uh, and I got to play this song. It was like, kind of, it felt really nice and epic. And, you know, and then there were other days where I was just like in between a couple bookshelves at Barnes and Noble, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure people are like, "What's what, you know? Who's uh, what this is guy? this guy so, doing?" <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So uh, you know, it was, a, it was a mixed bag, but um, I mean, man, that, that that's still that that whole thing feels like kind of just this like weird dream that happened because uh, it was just it, it was such a such a thing in, in my life. You know, I never had an opportunity like that come through, and it was cool of him to to work with somebody unknown. You know, I mean, kind of basically in in choosing to work with me, he he kind of he did choose a smaller platform. He could have. This we're talking about a multi, multi, multi millionaire. He could have hired, you know, Ed Sheeran to do this, you know, that sort of thing. So he, it was very kind of him to kind of, you know, be like, you know, I'm going to lift somebody else up, and I, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. It's pretty cool the fact too that somebody else, which I, I tell even other photographers this and stuff like that, and other, um, and I've heard this from other musicians as well that I've interviewed, that they've all yeah. said it just takes one song or one picture that somebody might have seen and they're going to share that with somebody else that could give you that opportunity. Totally. Like it could be something from 10 years ago, five years ago to two weeks ago. But it's amazing Mm -hmm. that you had a recording that was before that somebody knew about it, passed it on. And that's how it went through. I mean, that's incredible. 
Totally. Well, and you know, that's, I think that's the one, one encouraging, I mean, it's kind of frustrating and encouraging at the same time. Cause that the song that, um, I think we're, so we're talking about like 2016 when this was, um, all coming together. And, uh, you know, as far as the Nicholas Sparks project goes, but the song that caught his attention, I think I wrote in maybe 2010 and, uh, and released, uh, the year in 2011. So it came out in 2011. So it took like five or six years. Wow. Um, and I mean, it's not that, you know, I think the song was, was, uh, was a good song. It worked well with, with the audience and everything, um, relatively speaking, but, uh, you know, you, you, you I would have never guessed that like uh, the song from years and years ago would be the thing that would get me this opportunity now, you know, like you, and it's frustrating to think that that it was a song that no, you know, didn't have any particular attention from anybody, you know what I mean? Until that moment. Um, and so yeah, it, we all might be sitting on a thing that we did that could really impact our future that we just, you know, it's going to be another seven years before we ever know about it. <laughs> it's such a weird thing. You know? Yeah. I had a, I had a photograph of mine that I took, Oh, jeez, this was of a, a band at a local bar, and mm. it was an all-female ACDC cover band, and they're actually still around today, cool. and they're fantastic, mm. man. Oh, my God, they're so That's awesome. <laughs> um, and I photographed their set, and there's one shot that I took that was uh, the band, and there was a bunch of, you know, bartenders and, and just, you know, patrons around the area, and I thought the mm. picture sucked. Like, I just <laughs> hated that picture. Yeah. And I gave it to the band and they were like, oh, we like it. And I was like, okay, great. That's awesome. I'm glad you guys like it. I hate it, but I'm glad you <laughs> like it. And a few years later, I get an email um, from one of the PR people that works with uh, bands such as like Papa Roach and, and uh, oh, yeah. other popular bands. Uh -huh. And they said, hey, are you Chris Sterk? I hope I have the correct email. Just wanted to touch base uh, to see if you are still doing photography. This is a couple years wow. ago, and so I had yeah. sent an email back. The picture they saw was that picture. Wow. Was yeah. that crappy picture that I hated that they <laughs> saw, and they were like, oh, yeah. hey, we like it. Can you do something similar at a show for us like this? Wow. So it's just it's crazy yeah, awesome. to me how that all works out. And even with bands yeah. that I've talked about that have said, you know, yeah, we went in the studio, recorded this song. We hated this song. We thought it was crap. We just didn't want to do it. We wound mm -hmm. up doing it, putting on some small EP in the back end, and then two years later, it's on a soundtrack for some movie. Yeah, it, that is that's insane. It, you know, you hear that from yeah from bands like you know they have these mega hits and they see the hits. It's a, there's so much psychology to you know if you hear a song a million times it, it just it's it's so familiar it's kind of it becomes undeniable you know in in our own minds. Mm -hmm. But like it's so crazy to think that a band wouldn't know that the, the hit song is their hit song, but it's, I, I think that's true. I, I never know. I mean, I might, I might know like, Oh, it's one of these three or four, but it's never as obvious as it seems. And, and, you know, you hear like, what was it like? Uh, Don't stop believing was kind of, wasn't a hit originally. Yes, and yes, and yes. So like th those kind of things. And now to hear that, I'm like, don't stop believing wasn't immediately a hit. Are you kidding me? You know, yeah. but, but, but we, you know, we kind of, we, we internalize those melodies and it, it, they, they seem so obvious now, but, but I guess, you know, when you're the band writing it, it, you know, it doesn't have that same obviousness to it. Or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Interesting. The, the stuff that you think is, you know, the best, some people might not. And the stuff that mm -hmm, you don't think mm -hmm. is the best people think is the most wonderful thing in the world. So it's just <laughs> totally. funny how it always works out on that. Um, yeah, yeah. now you have played with, several many bands and i'll just start off to name a few uh you played mm -hmm. with coldplay you mm -hmm. played with maroon five of course we talked about sister hazel you mm -hmm. played with train dave matthews how did all these come about was this something that you wound up just kind of so you know sending out little feelers like hey you know i'd like to go on tour with you guys this is what i'd like to do or how did the process work out that you were on tour with some of these really really large bands yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of a, a lot of more hodgepodge of, of answers. Like the Sister Hazel thing, um, and the, my manager at the time was was really um, well connected and um, connected to the the record label that had some of their music, and so th kind of through those connections and that that channel, uh, you know, I was I got pitched to them for uh, some events, and you know, those events went okay, so they said, all right, let's get them on s some more shows. So that's kind of how that that one went. Um, but uh, and some of them are they sound more you know exciting than they are like uh, the Coldplay thing that was you know they're they're like one of the biggest bands in the world we we just got to be on the side stage at this bigger event so like it sounds you know I, I wish we got to play like in front of the you know, how many twenty five thousand people that were there you know what I mean but it was more like we got to play while that show was also there <laughs> so, well, I mean, so still, some of them the, the, some of them sound bigger than than others yeah, I mean, and I, still I feel there. like I feel that's kind of a cool thing. 
Totally, totally. So, so I mean, some of those were like that, like the biggest bands we've ever been with, you know, you, you can't, there's, you, unless you're on the same record label and, you know, you're kind of in that pipeline, you, you, best you can do is maybe like either side stage or maybe you're like the opener seven hours before, you know, before the, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the band really, actually yeah. even shows up at the venue. Yeah. But, uh, so, so some of it's like that, but, um, and then I also have been lucky enough to play the, the rock boat, which is a music cruise. Um, and, and so it's kind of through that connection have gotten to do, some of those, uh, you know, play with some of those larger acts. Um, so kind of a, a various different ways, but, um, you know, you just kind of, you kind of grab those moments when, when you can. And, and so some of it's just hustling, you're sending out an email or you're saying, Hey, you know, is there any time or, or any uh, availability on this bill? And then other times, you know, it's a lucky thing where somebody remembered you from a festival two years ago that, you know, they say, Hey, you don't, would you guys want to do this? It's two hours away and the money's not great, but you know, you get to open for so-and-so. So you just kind of, just kind of you level hope those out things the, keep the pros and the cons with it, kind of thing like that. Right? Yeah, totally. Well, totally. It's funny we talk about the festivals because this is. Oh, I'm going to show my age now. I'm forty, forty one. Mm-hmm. So uh, oh. back in, oh gosh, this is late '90s. Um, I went to a festival. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and we went to a festival. Mm-hmm. And the band that was actually not on the main stage, man, they had just started out, and they were in this little corner area that when you walk down there's like a bunch of shops like tents that were up just selling t-shirts and stuff and then at the end of that was a small little tent with a drummer a guitarist and a bassist and they started playing and i remember walking up and i'm standing there listening to them i was like oh these guys sound really good this you know this is a really fun band now again they weren't anywhere near the big show like i think it was oh i forget what bands it was I had a really fun time. <laughs> I can't remember what bands it was there. <laughs> but the band that That's I went cool. up to that I yeah. stood right in front of was Blink-182. Wow. Dude. And they were in this, I mean, it was literally the size of a small little t-shirt tent. And they wow. were at the end of everybody. Wow. And people were just walking by them, but they were playing mm-hmm. and they were singing. And I remember seeing a friend of mine, these guys are really, really good. Uh, really, really good. <laughs> And it was Man, and then so cool. years later, you know, I'm seeing a Blink-182 album with Damn It coming out. And I was like, oh, my God, those are those guys. So it's like, <laughs> That's it's, awesome. it's super cool. So, I mean, even when you have that kind of opportunity, it can always, you know, as we totally. kind of learn, lead into something else, hopefully on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah man, those are the most those are the most encouraging stories to hear that to know that, you know, that that kind of thing you know, happens that, you know, a band doesn't just immediately emerge as, you know, the obvious choice or something like that. I don't, I don't know. That's, that's cool. Yeah. And it's really yeah. all about it. Like you, like you said before, it's kind of one of those things that it's even with photography, it's like, you just hope to meet, you know, those kind of connections or have someone that can hear that music and give you that opportunity. So yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a tough call on that. Um, mm-hmm. Now we talked about the Lincoln theater shooting there and I, and that's when I first met you and that we talked and I got mm-hmm. my, my creepy uh, selfie photo with you guys. Um, I hope <laughs> no. that didn't I'm always happy to do selfie. (laughs) When I asked you guys that when I came in. Now, um, (laughs) during that uh, particular show at the Lincoln Theater, was that the first time that you had worked with Dylan or have you worked with him for years before that? We've been, yeah, we've we've worked together for years now. I think he joined uh, the project in 2012. Um, So so it was probably, um, you know, we'd probably been, I don't know when the Lincoln Theater, that was probably five years into us, us playing together, I would guess. Something like that, four or five years, something like that. And he's gone on tour with you. He's he's gone overseas with you. So he's, he's he kind of like a staple with within kind of your your setup that you have. Definitely, yeah. As as we kind of he he's the first. Uh, if we're gonna flesh out the the thing from a solo run, he's he's the first um, you know guy that gets added. Just um, he has this really great. Um, it's kind of funny. He he built a it's a suitcase drum kit. So it's a um, it's like a it looks like just a big tourist or suitcase and then uh, he can fit all the the components for the drum kit into it and then the, but the, the 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 case itself is the kick drum so um but it actually it works really well for duo stuff because you can get like a full drum kit groove without the like the volume and the in- dynamic intensity of a big kit so like you can kind of you can the, they play really well with an acoustic guitar those drums so so he and i, I do a lot of duo tours like that where um you know it can be kind of compact but we still get you know there's still like a beat and uh, a little bit of a groove um versus just me by myself and then yeah then i can flush out to I have a, a longtime bass player jim murhut and then uh, we have uh, mark lee shannon a wonderful guitar player that we can kind of kind of add into the the project as as we get bigger gigs is that uh, what he was sitting on when he was playing at the lincoln theater 
I, my guess is at the time that that was long enough ago that I think he was probably still using a cajon, which is like a wooden, a big wooden box. Yeah, he was um, tapping it too at some point in time. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what he had. So before we before we kind of changed gears to the uh, suitcase kit, um, he he had a, a different hybrid thing where yeah he he had like a it's, it looks like a for folks who don't know it's like a big wooden box that you sit on and then um, there's a snare like like on a snare drum on a regular kit there's a snare on the inside wall of the of the box and so when you hit it it sounds kind of like a snare drum oh, and then if, and okay. then if you hit, if you yeah and if you hit the bottom it sounds like a kick drum so you kind of get like two different two a couple different sounds you can you can get out of it and then he would have like a shaker and tambourine and kind of you know just basically try to emulate the a groove from a kit without having it there um, i was then, wondering that i was like what is he doing because it sounded good but i'm like what is he doing like how does he know where he's <laughs> hitting on this box <laughs> i was like what yeah. is this what is this contraption he's using so yeah, that makes he's, total if, sense okay i always feel if, if we don't have the full band i'm always like kind of explaining dylan to everyone you know because like either either i'm gonna be like yeah this is a suitcase we know we know it's weird <laughs> you know or or, or like, yeah like prior to that like i mean i don't it, most people don't even know how to, know how to spell cajon it's, it's c-a-j-o-n <laughs> yeah, I, it. I mean yeah oh, i mean sure. it's just it's just a weird you know there's we always have some weird thing that we have to like apologetically kind of like get everybody <laughs> on board with real quick but but uh it, it's just it's been fun getting creative like that because you kind of ironically you know you, you're you're getting away from the the drum groove that you had for the song but in doing so it kind of forces you to sometimes you find a good idea that like there are certain grooves that he does on that suitcase kit that we can't really get that sound on a full drum kit so you know you end up almost being happy with happier with certain things I don't, it's interesting how it all does he do together. stuff with you in the studio as well does he help record? he does yeah so on on uh but, for the most part, if you hear um, live drums on anything recent, it's it's him. Um, there's been there's been a producer or two, you know, over the years who have maybe played a part or two. Um, if Dylan wasn't in the room, but um, yeah, like the last record we just put out, which is called Court Street, Dylan. If you hear drums, that's Dylan. Um, and and he's even played the suitcase kit. Um, we have a song called I'm Coming Home that's one of the newer tracks. And it doesn't have a lot of drums on it, but there's a like a kick drum, and it's actually just the suitcase kit. Um, no because a kick, way. It, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because it just has a certain. It's got like a, I don't know how to describe it. Like a, it's a little bit smaller sound than a, a big kick drum for obvious reasons, but it also has like a certain kind of warmth to it. So it's more of like a thud than like a boom. <laughs> and that so is super it, cool. I just yeah. So when we were cutting the song, we were like, man, you know, actually. Maybe we need the suitcase for this. I've never said that out loud, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, we need to, we need, we really that, need the that sound That actually should have been here. the opening to the song. Just it starts off with, yeah, I think we need a suitcase for this. And then the song just kind of <laughs> kicks in right after that. Yeah. And what, how, how ironic to the songs about, you know, like travel coming home. Yes. And, uh, literally you hear, you hear one of the, the items uh, from, from, you know, from travel. And oh, it's, uh, that's I guess funny. that makes sense. That is too funny. That's, that's amazing because when I watched him play it, I remember saying to a friend of mine that I've seen, artists have like something similar to that, but I've never mm -hmm. seen it live. I've never seen anybody oh, cool. do it in person. So when he was yeah. doing it, and I remember I was backstage, um, taking the pictures of you guys. And all of a sudden I see him just stop. And he's going to do just tap in the box. I'm like, what is mm -hmm. he doing? But it's good not to actually know what, what it actually is. So it makes yeah. more sense to me now than it did to me at that time. <laughs> no, that's great. I do feel like sometimes, you know, like early in a set, people do have this like look like this furrow brow, like what, what's he what is he like like maybe dylan's trying to get away with something you know like maybe he's trying to pull a fast one on everybody but uh and he's like crap yeah, i forgot it, this part i just gotta tap something i'll just tap on the box here that's what i'll do yeah exactly yeah <laughs> but uh but man it, yeah it, it works out it works out it's it's fun it's fun he's a great guy too he, he and i if you think about you know like you're on, you're on the road with somebody you're you're standing next to them sitting next to them for hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. and he and i really get along well he, i'm lucky in that in that the players that i get to work with you know they're really they're great guys and they kind of they understand the the grind and, and how to kind of be uncomfortable for long periods of time if you're you know you're in a new place and you know or you, you got to take a sink shower that morning because there's just you know no option you know that, that kind of stuff it's really uh they're good guys yeah it's, I, I talked to him a couple times via instagram when you guys were on tour oh, i think cool. last year overseas nice. and he mm -hmm. he would post funny stuff like he would post this, this weird ass funny stuff on there. And I remember, I, I forget what it was, but I sent him a comment on it. And I was like, oh, make sure JD knows about that. And we just had this, this funny little thing go back and forth. But yeah, nice awesome. guy. Very talented guy, he too. Is. Very, very nice guy. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, he's a good follow because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I have to maybe more carefully curate. I can't really uh, post anything too 
insane yeah. to uh, to social media. But Dylan, he can get away with a little bit more. So you might seem, you know, you, the re- true behind the scenes is probably you know more accurate <laughs> from him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of the song "I'm Coming Home," and of course that is off your new EP that um, you mm-hmm. just released back in April, correct? <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. and it's called Court Street, which we talked a little bit mm-hmm. about before on there. Um, yeah. How did this EP come about? What was it? Has it been over a couple years of work, or how did this kind of music come together? Yeah, it does. It does kind of have an interesting story. I, I, we, you and I touched on on the pop sound of of uh, the release prior to it, which had a my scene and a few other tunes. It was very, very like deliberately pop and uh, and kind of allowing us to go in that direction. And um, I have a good friend. His name's Ryan Humbert, and he's a he's a wonderful musician in his own right, singer songwriter, and he works with a band called the Shootouts, and they're they're like a uh, classic country western band it's, it's a really cool thing to hear because it's like you know throwback to the, the old school you know true tried and true country music um uh, but but he so he was kind of he was saying like man i he knows me as the guy with an acoustic guitar playing by myself at a bar or something like that and he was like man i really like to just capture it would be cool to capture you guys as you just sound you know playing music live you know like with no real bells and whistles but just play the play the songs um and i w- it was just kind of at this point where i felt comfortable enough um, as a as a as a singer and musician, and I felt like the band had played together long enough that we kind of did have our own chemistry or you know however you want to call it. And so uh, so he, so he he's he can produce stuff really well. He's a wonderful producer as well. And then also that Mike Estock, who I mentioned, who owns Court Street in in Canfield, Ohio, near Youngstown. Um, Mike was it was a great friend, and he so Mike Ryan and I are all sitting in a room together drinking whiskey talking music ryan's ryan's blaring <laughs> gotta music whiskey gotta have yeah, whiskey yeah. it's a critical <laughs> element with any 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 uh scheme and anytime a musician's about to spend money there's probably whiskey involved we, we don't we don't have a lot to talk about so we, we need to be a little bit you yeah, know, buttered we, up. we gotta get a little buzzed up that's what we gotta do yeah <laughs> yeah but uh but anyway yeah we're all we're sitting there we're all talking music and we're we're kind of geeking out on uh more of the production stuff like uh, the arrangements of songs or like you know the, this producer does this and that kind of stuff and then we just kind of it, it just kind of evolved evolved into um, I played I think it was I'm, I'm coming home um, yeah I think it was I'm coming home I played and and we we it ended up like and Mike sits down at the piano and starts playing the piano part that you hear in the opening of the song and I'm oh, playing wow. the acoustic okay. and I'm playing the acoustic and um and you know Ryan Ryan is he's 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 a good like I don't want to call it like he's a good like quarterback in the room as far as like arrangement ideas like uh you know let's cut the dynamic here or like right here this is where the drum comes drum comes in you know that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and so he's kind of almost like quarterbacking and uh, mike and i are kind of like piecing together little ideas in the arrangement and i mean this was just like a hangout session that turned into we had a kind of pre-produced a song just sitting there for the fun of it and it was just kind of obvious immediately like "Eh, we we might want to pursue this so i I talked to the band i'm like guys this i think we should kind of return to form and do this natural sounding thing and and uh, Mike and Ryan are, are game to do it. And um, so it, it, it went from there to, um, you know, we were able to bring in some more musicians. Mark Lee Shannon on guitar, I mentioned he's a wonderful guitar player. And um, and we ended up just, you know, getting in a room and we cut uh, we cut two of the songs in a, in a day, I want to say. And then uh, we, we like several months went by and then we cut the rest of the record. But the whole thing was it was it's all either live. So a couple of songs like I'm Coming Home and a song called Evergreen and lightning are all entirely live and you know vocal so guitar you were, everything you together. weren't mixing at all i mean it was pretty much just like you were doing a live concert show all the mics set up recorded everything all mm-hmm. at the same time yeah so we're all kind of spread out throughout the studio um and uh, and yeah and there's just a uh, you know you, you, they, they say go and you know we start to play and uh so, you know the first go through is getting the mics and all the levels right and kind of making sure we can hear everything and stuff and but then yeah we would we would run the song um you know, a couple a couple of songs we'd only had to run, thankfully, you know, a couple of times. And, and some of the songs we'd, we'd run a bunch. So we got that one take that we really felt like it had the magic. But, um, yeah, so that's, that's how we cut them. And a, f- a few of them, you know, I, we, we'd layered stuff in. So we'd go back and put um, background vocals or like a tambourine or um, I sang um, overdub vocals on a couple of them. So, I mean, it was it was a mix. But the, the, the band sound that you hear is like all of us truly playing together live, which it sounds it's, it sounds like a, a kind of obvious. Like, yeah, well, that's how you would do that. But a lot of a lot of music is it cut that way oh you know, yeah in the studio it's you know it's, it's you know drums and maybe drums and bass and then you go in and layer the guitars and so to have everybody just playing it live there 
something happens where, um, you know, there's a push and pull and it feels live and then you get this bleed from the microphone. So, you know, there's a drum mic that catches a little bit of the guitar amplifier. And then, uh, you know, you, you can, you can hear the guitar playing in my vocal microphone. And there's something about that, that it's risky because it's got to sound right, but, but it also kind of it glues it all together differently. So there's just something magical about that. that um, you know, I really feel lucky that we were able to, able to do it that way. It is. We, I, the first time I got to actually see a studio recording, um, there was a band, Shun the Raven, I'd worked with for, for quite a while. And yeah. I went to a studio to watch them record and do their set. And I was amazed because until you really go inside the studio or experience mm-hmm. it, you really have no idea how it is done. Mm-hmm. You might yeah, hear, you know, people might kind of guess, oh, well, this is done first, this is done first. Mm-hmm. I always thought at least in in most cases, that the singer would come in with a guitarist, write down their track first, and then everybody would mm-hmm. follow in after. Well, when I went to right. go record with this band, Chad actually did his drums before anything else. Yeah, so they would yeah. play a rough draft of the song, he would record his drums, and then the guitarist would come in and play on top of the drums. So they're actually like following the beat of the drum. And right. it was just so weird to me because I always assumed that it was just, you know, the singer and the guitarist would come in or and start it off and the drummer would just follow mm-hmm. that rhythm. Yeah. So it's amazing to, to see actually how it works. And I can only imagine that doing it in that sense of almost like a live performance, did mm-hmm. you have more stress doing it that way? Was it a little yeah. bit more difficult instead of doing it the, the other, the other way? In, in, in some ways, it, it is more stressful, and in some ways, it's uh, more re- relaxing. And the one way that it's it's nice is that um, you you really are hearing everything as one, um, you know, one recording, one piece. So so like there might, I mean, I can tell you that for sure there are moments like in the guitar where if if I if I had cut that guitar part without the band playing with me, I'd have like really been nitpicky about like a little thing here or there. And the fact that we all played it together and it's it kind of gelled. Like even some of like my moments that aren't perfect they still dynamically kind of sit in the mix right so because we're playing together we're kind of all feeling the push and pull of each other so um so in that way you you almost you, even even if there are some like little imperfections uh they almost kind of work for you instead of against you so yeah. it's kind of nice and then also you're not you know you're not in the weeds as much because everything's just as it happened as it really sounds together so that's kind of nice but it is stressful because you do you, i mean you definitely have to especially especially when i was playing and singing on the tracks that where we were cutting we kind of made the decision ahead of time like this one's gonna we're gonna cut the vocal with everything this one is more of a like let's go in and, and get in the weeds a little bit more mm-hmm. so like the ones that i knew i was gonna sing on live i was definitely like a little bit more like uh and <laughs> yeah, i'm imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm coming home. This is how tight some of these schedules were. I'm coming home. We we recorded the day after our record release from our previous release. So we put out um, the Compass EP, which is our big, you know, pop uh, adventure, you know. Yeah. And then, but literally the next morning, so we had that CD release show, and then with with those players, and then the next morning we met at Court Street and started cutting this new, absolutely opposite sounding project. Wow. Then the next morning, and so yeah. so I was nervous for a couple reasons, but my voice was I had just played like a you know a longer set, and uh, I didn't have like a hundred percent vocal, and 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 I actually I didn't even plan to cut that one with the vocal immediately, but then Ryan, uh, you know, he was kind of at the helm at the at that moment, and he was like, hey, why don't you just he's like it feels different when you're when you're singing it he could like i I was i wasn't singing at first i was just playing with the band and he's like you know it just it sounds your dynamics in your playing are different when you're singing this song so he's like why don't you just try one pass with the vocal just see what happens and then it immediately became apparent like he was right and it does sit differently if i'm playing it so so that that vocal is is not perfect i mean you can if you kind of microscope it it's it probably wouldn't sound like like quite like that would be a little bit smoother and uh and probably a, a little bit different delivery if if i had like rested up and came in and, and did it you know the proper way but the fact that we just kind of cut it like that i think there's a certain kind of roughness to it that that fits you know or you know and, and in hindsight it was the right call so kudos to ryan for that <laughs> one of the songs so. that I, i've talked to you about this before that really honestly impacted me a lot with yeah. that's on um the new ep is a song called kid now yeah. I'm not, I, I tried to kind of dissect on what it is about the song and, and I can only kind of describe it. The song is sort of in my vision, the way that I am feeling it when the song is being mm-hmm. played, it's almost like me telling myself the younger me that mm-hmm. things are going to be okay. 
sort of yeah. always is kind of how it felt to me. There, there's one line in it that this isn't what you thought it was, and I might have this a little wrong. Um, yeah, that's okay. But this isn't what you thought it was. You, um, I think it's your st- starting now to feel like giving up. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that line, it reminded me of my young twenties because I wasn't exactly the smartest 20 year old (laughs) that ever existed. (laughs) Uh, Plenty of mistakes in my life at that time. Same, same. And so when I, when I thought about that, it was this kind of, uh, I got this, this feeling that music does to you that gives you this almost um, it's okay. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. When yeah. writing this song, was this song almost a letter to yourself? But also on top of that, you are now a dad. Is this yeah. kind of a yeah. song to your daughter? And by the way, congratulations on the other one oh, that's on the way for you, you. as well. Thanks, Make sure I add that. Sure. There's a congratulations to that. Or is that, <laughs> is this song kind of towards your, your little girl or, or what is the song kind of based on? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's kind of it, it comes from kind of two directions. The one direction is it is kind of a, a letter to to myself in the sense that um, I just you know I, I I was getting down on myself and, and about different things and I knew that it, I was kind of misplacing my I just knew I was in the wrong headspace about a lot of things and uh, I just kind of I kind of heard like a, the this voice in the back of my head saying like Hey kid you know kid you you got to do all the right things you're not no one's gonna come and save you. You're not going to get thanked for it. You still got to do it. Yeah. And that was kind of like this, this voice I heard. Um, <laughs> and at the same, you know, and, and I kind of, I like that. So when I said, when I say kid, I, I, I'm not necessarily addressing a younger kid in, in that regard, but I mean, I, I can certainly understand why, why it feels that way um, to, to somebody listening. And then, but also uh, it was, it was amidst the, um, you know, like the me too crisis. And like when everyone, all these like, Previously, uh, no, p- folks previously, you know, we saw them as heroes yes, and, yeah. and then, you know, they came out to be, you know, some of the worst folks. And I, I was just I think I was just kind of coming to this realization that, like, you know, there are a lot of there's just not there's a lot of bad going on. There's a lot of like misplaced um, trust in in the system. And, and also, mm-hmm. like, there's just some like really strange change where, I you know, a couple decades ago, it seemed like, you know, somebody's character was a lot more a piece of like whether or not we would lift them up and you know yeah. as a society and it, now it's, it really does seem to be like we just kind of we, we pay attention to like money and and popularity and and um and not the character and, of the person and, yeah and maybe character is, is kind of an afterthought and and uh i don't know i'm not i, I don't think we ever had it right frankly but it did it did seem like there's just been a shift toward like celebrity versus character in in the in the past decade or so and um and maybe that's some of that's like social media stuff. I don't know. I'm not going to, I'm a priority. A part of speaking me, I'm just going to intertwine. A part of me does yeah. think it's probably social media. <laughs> a yeah, part yeah. Of me I mean, does in a way, in yeah, yeah. Of that. <laughs> definitely. I, I can, I feel I can like that same voice that says, Hey kid is saying right now, like, Hey kid, you're talking above your pay grade, like slow it down. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but I mean, there is, there is like that was going on. And, and I think yeah. I was just, I was, it hit me in a way I, in hindsight, I don't know why I was so, emotional about it but it really bothered me that the people in these positions were that negligent with their position you know Mm -hmm. and so i was kind of thinking but i also was holding on to this idea that you know like there's there have to there has to be more good than bad there have to be more good people than bad people in the world and and like it's just we we are we disproportionately see the bad ones because you know they're they're gonna make the news it's that stuff that you know that that gets covered exactly yeah that's the word the loudest yeah and so uh so i was like well you know nowadays if you're the good guy you don't even get it, it can almost set you back to do the right thing you know Mm -hmm. i mean you can you if, if you're not thinking about a power play that can work to your detriment, but that's probably, you probably shouldn't live your life trying to take advantage of people and stuff like that. So, so, you know, rather than give the heroes of this era an anthem, that's not really what it is. You know, it's, it's a ballad, it's a plotting tune and it's not, it's not congratulatory. It's more like just a nudge. And so that's, that's kind of what that song was supposed to be was like, you know, there are people doing the right things and they're pushing themselves through the muck with no reward and, and this is this was kind of like me trying to write an ode to that, you know, to the, the the person who you know doesn't get anything for it, but they're doing it anyway. And uh, and so like in recent this past you know several months, I've been kind of putting it out there for like frontline workers, people in, in healthcare and in uh, uh, delivery services and stuff like that, where uh, you know they're, they're it's the same thing. They're out there 
in a much more uh, compromised position. And other than like, other than like maybe, you know, somebody says thanks occasionally, they're really, there's, it, they're just at more risk for, for a very little gain. And, uh, and yeah. so I'm just kind of, just kind of a song for those, those folks. And, you know, if, if, I can apply it to moments personally, but, um, I, I, always, I definitely wanted it to be a little bit bigger than, than yeah, just, just for, for me. I well, was, when, when I, when I listened to it, when I, the, the, again, that main lyric that was like when, how you feel like giving up. And mm -hmm. then you follow the song, of course, with that kind of like, hey, kid, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to be yeah. OK. You'll 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 get through this kind of thing. You're, yeah. you're going to do the right thing. You'll you'll make the right choices. At least that's how I kind of felt on it. To me, it was yeah. like this, that, this uplifting song. It was a song that if I felt, you know, kind of down and, and, to, and to be yeah. honest, I work in medical. I work in medical mm -hmm. outside of what I do for F28 Live, and I have friends that work mm -hmm. in medical and work in hospitals and things like that. And so yeah. it's, it can be stressful work when you're in that situation. Sure. And so sometimes you, you come home, you know, and, and people and patients and things like that do get, you know, nervous and scared about everything that's going on. So even when you're scheduling them for, you know, neural lab appointments, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was one of those songs that you come home, you're like, you're feeling a little bit down. You're like, all right, you know what, am I going anywhere like am i doing the right thing right and yeah, i click on that song and it's like I'm, i'll be all right i'll be good you know i'll be, <laughs> man, I'll be fine is, so i think to awesome. me that's what that song that's why it impacted me there's certain songs that will impact me in a way that i just repeat over and over and over again or i listen to over and over again and that's definitely one of the songs so if anybody's listening check out the song kid on the new EP because it really is that song that just elevates you to like, okay, I'm going to be good. Thanks, <laughs> man. man. Dude, dude seriously, thanks for saying that. Month made over here. I, that, that's a, that, that's like exactly what I would I would hope for any song, you know, especially that one. So I appreciate you saying that, man. I'm glad that I'm glad it hit you like that. How is how is everything going with the new EP coming out? I do see on Spotify that you've gotten. Let's see. I think when I got the notes here, I'm coming home at sixty six thousand listens. I think is the one I looked at when I saw him yeah, there. Yeah, uh, um, sounds right. Kid has 75,000. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how's everything with the music going? Or do you feel comfortable with how the music is being spread out? How do, how do you feel that the EP is going? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's probably a horrible uh, business decision to to put it out in April, you know, given everything <laughs> else going on. But uh, we, we, did, we just kind of didn't want to wait. It was in the pipeline at that point. And, and, um, and I, I, I mean, I, part of me was like, yeah, we could delay it and maybe we make a little more money. But, um, the truth was what also, you know, people don't have, um, as much going on and, and maybe this would be something good. And I, I was thinking of things like, like those song, the way those, what those songs talk about. And it, it kind of made sense for the moment, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think relative to that, uh, it's been great. Uh, it's certainly folks have been very supportive and, and really kind and, and have streamed it. And I, numbers wise, uh, it, it's good. I mean, for us, that uh, those numbers are, are, are really good and, and relative to, to, you know, what I've seen in the past and everything. So I'm really happy about that. They're also kind of arbitrary because uh, I've heard songs that are, I think are uh, phenomenal that have, you know, 700 streams and then i've heard oh, yeah. uh, songs that i don't love that have mm -hmm. over a billion so i, I don't yeah. really know anymore <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but I'm, I'm glad that i'm glad people are listening to it and, and it means something when i when i hear stuff like what you said about kid i mean that's that i don't you, you know that song could have two streams or, or a billion but uh the fact that it means that to you i mean that's pretty that's huge so well, that's, that's, that's that not me just you know, throwing words out. That's, that's a real thing. So. Yeah. That's the amazing part of music. And even in a lot of cases, and when I talk to people, even about photography, there's certain things that can elevate people and make people feel good, whether it could be an image, you know, it could be an image of the ocean and they just feel like they're at peace kind of thing like that. Mm -hmm. It could be a certain mm -hmm. song. So it's, it's interesting too, when you just said about the, the views and everything, um, I've talked to other fellow photographers and you'll see a photographer that has, you know, one view on a photo that is absolutely yeah. phenomenal, like yeah. just yeah. outstanding. Yeah. And then you see a mediocre photographer who just started doing it two days ago and, you know, has a bazillion likes, but you know, right. kind of thing like that. So it's, it's interesting yeah, how it works, but in the end, it's one of those things that if you're happy with what you produced or what you made or what you created and it's out there in the world it's something mm -hmm. that at least for me that i have to take joy in it myself it's not something i'm doing necessarily for the world to tell me they like it it's something right. for me to go i like it i like how it is and i'm happy with it and i think that's, that's one awesome. of the important things too out there and especially with with uh, photography and i would imagine in music as well 
So, yeah, man. Oh, I, I agree with that hundred percent. I mean, there, anybody, yeah, anybody kind of, um, and are you, I'm sure there are parallels. I know that there are parallels in, in photography, but I mean, you, anyone doing this uh, long enough, you, you start to, under, I mean, I understand what the structure is to, you know, like a quote unquote hit song. You know, how do you, how do you make a pop, mm-hmm. you know, a pop hit? It, 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 it there, you know, there, it's, it's almost math to some extent. Um, but you, you know, if you, if you, if you can't sing that song over and over again to an audience, you know, night after night, uh, what i don't like i just yeah i don't i don't i'd rather i'd rather be grinding it away but but really believe in in what i'm singing than uh you know have a hit song but then you know i have to have to face the truth of that every night that would be horrible so i mean you know it kind of answers itself at, at the end of the day and it, it, you know thankfully there are yeah. people who you know their tastes are different they they i mean i i like pop music for sure and there are people that like that's their whole jam and so you know those are the ones that I think should be singing those songs because it, it, it means what, what it means, you know, to them. Um, but I, yeah, there's some, some stuff just, I, I wouldn't be able to sing. I could, I always joke. I could never sing like the, the party anthem tune. I'm just like, no one would believe me anyway. Like I, if, as soon as I mentioned like a limousine or uh, like some sort of alcohol, you know, like a crystal type of reference, you know, the, like the hate I would get quickly for that. <laughs> People would be like, dude, no way. We know you're not cool, you know, <laughs> but, uh, so I mean, you know, you just got to find the, the people who are right for the job. I'm, I'm not, I'm not the, you know, I'm not well, the hit guy. But and in the same way, you're, you know, maybe you're not going to photograph the, you know, the weird thong Instagram model who would get no, you a ton of no, views. No, I'm you not. Know? No, yeah, I can. <laughs> it, 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 actually, I'm so. The, I'm sorry. I have to say a side story here that's just a little bit funny. But we yeah. <laughs> photographed Nelly. Um, oh, yeah. and at the Walnut Creek and it was Flo Rida, I believe was opening okay. up for him and <laughs> Flo Rida came out and some of my best photographs are of Flo Rida. Nice. And as he comes out, he's doing his thing, but all of a sudden four strippers come out and <laughs> it is thong city just yeah. in front of you. And I'm trying to find a way to not photograph that. Um, because it just, it takes away from what I'm trying to do. Right, so it was right. just an interesting thing. It, it just popped in my head because I'm moving around. I remember one photographer, he goes, dude, we keep going back and forth. I was like, I got to get her butt out of my face. I got to, you know, I got to go yeah. and, and take this picture here. And, and you see some photographers that would have been like, oh my God, you know, they, they take oh, those yeah. pictures. But for me, I was just my brain. I was like, I don't care. I, I got to get Flo Rida. I got to get this picture of Flo Rida, you know, that's in <laughs> It's just well, funny I mean, you know, <laughs> had you had you had more thong in the shots, you, you would. I'm sure you'd hear from <laughs> you hear from a lot of folks yes, saying, like, you know, think you finally hit your strike, Chris. You know, there's <laughs> something about these new images that are really striking. Yeah, these, me. these are. <laughs> These images yeah, no. are really telling a great story, Chris. I really feel like this is really, you know, this is showing yeah. Flo Rida's style on there. Um, right. One of the artists, actually, that I thought of when you talked about playing that song, you know, during tour kind of over and over again, there's a song from the band Heart, and she did an interview, and I can't remember which one it was that did the interview. Um, she has dark hair. I can't remember her name. You know, I, I, I know that band, but I don't know their names. Yeah. So she did, uh, they did a song called all I want to do is make love to you. I don't know if oh, you've yeah. ever heard of that song. I have, yeah. Hugely popular. And she yeah, did an yeah. interview a couple years ago that she said she hated playing that song <laughs> yeah. and they didn't even want to record it, but they had to because it was a hit. Like the people were like, mm-hmm. no, this is going to be a hit. She hated the whole yeah. idea of the song, what it was about. And when I heard that, it really opened up my eyes to be like, wow, this, I never really thought about that before, that there's got to be songs that some of yeah. these artists write that they just hate playing every <laughs> single night. Yeah, and, definitely. And, you know, the fans are like, whoa, and they're like, oh, my God, if I have to play this one more time. <laughs> yeah, but no, I, got a, I got a couple like that. I think the other thing is you kind of, you, you know, like when she wrote that song, you know, as she was writing it, she – you know, she believed in it, or I mean, it, it was the truth as it came out. But you know, you change. You know, there's there are some songs that are, are like a little too saccharine, or or they just don't line up with my like what I believe anymore. You know, yeah. and mm-hmm. and so that I have in the past that that are harder for me to want to play, uh, and for those reasons. So I imagine, you know, I mean, she might have really liked it at the moment, but like you know, a couple weeks later, she was like, "Yeah, that's I don't know what I was, you know, <laughs> it's like a weird, uh, you know, like you yeah. get drunk and you you say something that you don't mean, and then you got to like live with that. You know." It's, Oh, I got Almost plenty of those. Sort of oh, thing. my Lord. Yeah. <laughs> same, same. I got plenty of those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I can only imagine that just to be in and, and having to know that the whole world is going to listen to that song all, mm-hmm. all the time. 
and you kind yeah, of have right. to. So for artists, I can imagine it's one of those things too, for especially musicians, that you might record something and then ten years later you're like, oh, I hate that, but then it wants it's yeah. there for life. Like everybody's going to yeah. hear that for the rest of time now. Now that it's out into yeah. the world. Um, stakes, stakes are high. <laughs> one of the uh, things I do want to kind of talk about before we go um, is uh, uh, obviously with the EP that's come out, what is your plans for 2021 right now? Are you looking at certain dates that you're going to start doing or you have any kind of idea yeah. of how that's going to look? And that's a good question. I'm, it's really, it's a lot of like fingers crossed kind of talk, but um, uh, yeah, I mean the, the European run that, that we had scheduled um, hopefully is going to be the, uh, basically a mirror um, exact, the exact same uh, days of the the following year. So 2021, we're hoping to be on on tour in, in Germany and Switzerland and stuff in in uh, April. But uh, I don't, you know, who knows at this point what what's really going to happen. But um, yeah. So so I mean, I, I basically I think I've got um, a few new songs that I'm, I'm I've been kicking around during you know the quarantine days and stuff, and and I'm hoping to put out another song or two, uh, you know, this this year, um, and then uh, start to tour in 2021 with, with a little bit of, uh, intention, you know, around this stuff, but it, what the, I don't know what that means. I imagine there'd be a lot of dates in the States. Hopefully that European tour will happen. And then, uh, you know, probably pepper it with some home concerts and some smaller listening rooms and stuff as well. So we got to get you back to Raleigh, North here. Carolina, man. We got to get you back here. Yeah, I would <laughs> love, I would love to come back. Long. We got to get you back here. Yeah. I got yeah, yeah, to talk to some people like Lincoln theater. <laughs> That, that that'd be awesome i would love to love to get back at the carolinas for a while early on i was there a bunch and then it I, you know for no real good reason but just you know we I, we changed agents a, a couple times over the years and stuff and i mm. think we, we just kind of we, we didn't really get back into that circuit like a out of like so it's great it's a great neck of the woods so i don't know why um, well I'd let like me ask back. um i'm gonna ask some quick questions um these are some things that uh some of our listeners when we do interviews with artists and musicians kind of like to know they like to hear these mm-hmm. little kind of behind the scenes stories uh cool. so one of the main questions i always get asked to ask the artist is what is the weirdest thing that's happened to you or strangest thing that's happened to you or even more like did this just really happen on tour to you while you're on, on tour. tour is there any particular thing that sticks oh, out in your man. head that's like that was freaking weird hmm uh that i can share <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh, true on top of that that you can uh, share let's yes see. man I, these this is these are tough these are tough um Mm. It's okay if you don't have one. That's fine no, too. Yeah, no, I mean there. Uh, this is this is just kind of weird. I don't know if this is the weirdest one, but just so that I don't totally um, bail on the question, um, there was this one venue that we stayed at. So when you tour in Europe, you uh, a lot of times it, it, it's a really nice kind of culture for for touring because the, the venues will either put you up in a hotel or they have like a spot for you on the premises. So oh, wow, um, and, and a lot of the places have a spot on the premises system that's a very hit or miss sometimes it's like a very nice spot and you know like there's a really clean bathroom and it's it's almost like better than a hotel situation and then other times it's like there's this closet where we put a blow-up mattress and you guys can stay there if you want and there I'm, there might be sheets up there too you know so it's, just kind of, it's really hit or miss but uh but this this one venue that we played and i, I won't say its name not that anyone listening might might know it or, or not but i, I just don't want to well keep anonymity but yeah, um, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, I hear you. but anyway we played this venue and then it was it was like a pub style um venue in germany and uh, you, the bands would stay upstairs. There was like a, a, a kind of an apartment type setup upstairs. So um, the guy's like, yeah, you can stay up there. There's pillows and um, some couches and stuff. You can just kind of spread out, make yourself at home. No big deal. So we're like, okay. So we go up there and uh, there, it, it was obvious that, you know, I don't know, 50 to 75 bands had stayed there before us that year. <laughs> and it was just, you know, it, it had, it had the look and the smell of it. Let's say. Oh, the and smell, so oh, I have yeah. smelled bad re- re- rooms before. Yeah. yeah. Dude, and the pillows, the, <laughs> the pillows, like they didn't have pillowcases. They were just like throw pillows. And so like, you just, you know, you don't know, you just don't know what you're, what you're dealing with, you know, you and black I, I just light with you at the same time. No. And it's frankly on purpose. I don't have, cause I don't want to know, you know, yeah. like, it's just like, at some point there are just moments in this job where you are like, it, it is, it is 2 AM and there you, you, mm-hmm. you're going to make a call that you would never make <laughs> in broad daylight. You know what I mean? And so like, I'm just, you know, I grab a pillow and, uh, it, we lay down, but what we didn't know is that th- this gentleman also lived up there as well. Oh. And there's, and there was this, the, the, it was just such an awkward situation because there were two, there was a bathroom with two doors and a tub 
and the tub was just it, it was like a tub with a shower head. So like the shower oh, head no. <laughs> uh, in, down into the tub and then the, the, the two doors and neither of the two doors closed all the way. Like they just they were like the kind of door that was like it would kind of jam in the frame and it would just stay open. So like you couldn't use the bathroom, shower, or do anything without both parties being very vis- visually aware of you being in there. And it was just uh, I just remember this kind of song and dance where like I'm like holding a towel, trying to go to the bathroom quickly and, and also not wake <laughs> this guy up. And I'm like, well, we're <laughs> This is one of those sink shower days, you know, because I'm not going <laughs> to bathe in front of this guy. You know? And it's just like, but we found that out, like, we're going to sleep and then we hear him and the light comes on and, you know, he's in there, like, brushing his teeth. And it's like, man, oh, this is so weird. Strangely that's intimate. Weird. But, like, that, I wish that's not even that. I mean, you know, that that's pro- that probably happened twice on that tour or something like that. But, uh, but you know, those kind of moments on the road happen um, here and there. And uh, you, you kind of, I'm, I'm very good at, like, uh, you know, actually, I'm co- that song. I'm coming home is just as much about coming, literally coming home, <laughs> as it is like finding your own peace in your, inside yourself. Yeah. You know, so there's just some moments where I'm like, you know what, uh, this is all just an illusion, and I can, I can take control of my own consciousness and get take, and I can transport myself out of this. <laughs> it's a and I'm, I'm doing my imagination. I'm, yeah, I'm doing that all the time, and I know it's BS, but I'm doing it anyway. So, <laughs> what is know, um... that? <laughs> What is one of the artists or musicians that you would love to tour with? And I'm going to kind of twist the question with either dead or alive. Wow. Okay. Wow. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, I, can I, can I, can I give three? Is that sure. okay? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Sweet. Okay. Um, Beatles for every obvious reason. Yep. And uh, yeah. it's a cliche answer. So I'll just keep moving. Um uh, Paul Simon, I, I just I love his music. I oh think he's God, he's yeah. I think he's I think he's underrated, and I and he's already very highly rated. But I think he's underrated. I just love that guy, and I think he's he's awesome. Um, and I, I would lo- I'd be awesome just to, to tour with him and be part of that. Um, and then I uh, you mentioned Coldplay, and I am uh, I'm a I'm a Coldplay proponent, even though they are like a uh, they seem to be like a, a recent magnet for haters. But I, I I defend that band. I think sonically they they always do something fresh and interesting. Oh, and, I've liked Coldplay um, for I'm, years, yeah. Yeah, man, I'm just a fan of, of they always change up their methods and I, I, I would I defend them. I think there's a reason why they're they're what they are. But um, anyway, so I would I think that would be a really, you know, kind of an honor to, to be part of that tour, too. Any, any of those three. I pick like huge musicians, but I, I just respect those three artists quite a bit. So uh, and out of the music that you've written mm-hmm. over the years, including years ago, do you have yeah. a particular song that is your favorite that you play? I know that's such yes. an odd question to ask. No, that's a, so a good many one. Songs you write, but but is there a particular yeah. one? Uh, it, 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 it changes for sure. I think uh, I really like to play, um, and I think the band likes to play the song uh, "I Don't Want to Be Right," which is a newer one on the the new EP. Um, and I, I like what that says. That it's probably between that one and Evergreen, um, which is another tune on on the new EP. Those two songs are uh, are both fun to play, and and um, you know we're we're, uh, we're probably extra proud of them just for song based reasons and stuff. So yeah, either Ever- of those two. Yeah. Evergreen is one of the most popular ones. I think actually on Spotify and other links, I think that's almost close to 115,000 listens. Oh yeah. So okay. A, yeah. Yeah. That one, that one song. is, uh, it, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that one does, does, um, pretty well, uh, you know, cross age groups and stuff, which is nice. So and we, we, I, we like to close with that one cause it, it, it's kind of a, it's, it's not really like a, you know, it's not really like a, a high energy song, but it, it has a, I don't know. It has a certain gravity personally, but I think, I think, you know, folks kind of get it um, when, when they hear it, I hope anyway. So. And the last question that everybody always wants us to ask is what is one thing you can't live without, whether on tour or not on tour, but what is that one item or thing that you just always have to have with you? Coffee. <laughs> That's a, uh, yeah, I had, I actually had a band member say, um, antacids one time to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's, man, that's, that, that, that answers a couple questions. Yeah, because <laughs> when I think of coffee, I'm thinking acid reflux. Okay, acid antacids. That's what oh, I need yeah. on there for it. Gotcha. Um, yeah, yeah, got it. Well, JD, thank awesome. you so much for sitting down and talking with me. I know we had kind of planned this for a while, and we're actually going to break this podcast up into two podcasts because oh, cool. um, we had so much fun talking. We talked for quite a while. Um, yeah. Now, some of the stuff that people want to check out is your website, which is jdiker.com. 
Mm-hmm. And then you also are on Spotify, Apple, iTunes. You have a YouTube channel as well. And we'll link all that information in the blog post uh, that does a review of or an overview of this podcast. Is there okay. anything else you want to mention to fans um, to let them know, you know, kind of new upcoming stuff or any kind of websites or anything to check out? Uh, no, I mean, I think, I think, you know, I'm, I'm probably, if, if you're on a platform, I'm, I'm probably there doing my uh, shameless promotional work. So, uh, you know, if you're on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or wherever, I, I hope you'll find me and, and, uh, and connect and, and, uh, and I'm pretty good. I, I, I'm pretty good about getting back to messages and comments and stuff as, as quickly as I can. So I'd, I'd love to meet everybody and, and, and chat and actually, you know, be connected. So whatever that still, means to you. You still do the live stuff too, right? You do your, on YouTube. I you do. do some yeah. I, I, I go, so I have a, I do have, a, I guess I should mention that, um, I do have a Patreon page and so I go live every, um, every Monday night I have this little, uh, it's like a 45 minute show called JDTV where it's, um, it's called three, it's, it's three songs in a segment. So I play a couple tunes and then I have some cheesy or weird or comedically uh, centered. Like I'm, I, uh, you know, I did a cooking show where I teach you how to make a sandwich, stuff like that. Just, <laughs> just, 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 I just kind of goof around, yeah, cool but um, it's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like, that. Uh, I like was, the cooking sandwich thing. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was called emergency sandwich and I had a toaster oven on a couch <laughs> in my basement. It was actually uh, horrifyingly, dangerous uh, stunt. I wish but, I could have seen that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to get you a link. But uh yeah, so so um, I'm doing um live events on on Patreon and then sometimes on you know Facebook or Instagram and stuff. So I'm I'm trying to keep it busy. you can find me if, if you're looking for sure. So. Well thank you again JD. Everybody go to F28Live.com, click on the podcast link up there. You will see the first episode. Now again like I said we're gonna break this episode up into two. Um so there'll probably be about thirty minutes each per episode. Um you can also subscribe to our mailing list at f28live.com you will get updates on that and also concert highlights when we cover for the 2021 season jd thank you so much for being here with me and i appreciate it and i wish you the most success in the world and i am going to keep following you and share your music to everyone because it's just absolutely fantastic so thank you thank you so much chris thank you so much for having me and i do i do want to just say yeah i truly am a fan of of your work you're a wonderful photographer and it's this is your support of the years has been you know, bar none, you're just always there for, for, for me and the projects. And yeah, it means a lot. So I, I appreciate you a lot. Man. Oh, thanks, JD. I do appreciate that. Now I'm going to go Definitely. and see if my head can fit through the door when I walk out the door here. So it's <laughs> swelled up so big on there. <laughs> Same. I'm, I'm about to go upstairs and, and, and uh, check in with my wife and she's just going to see that I'm, I'm all charged up from getting all these compliments from me. So <laughs> I'm in trouble already. All right, JD. Thank cool. you so much. We'll talk to you thanks, soon. Brother.